Hello, everyone. My name's Jared King, and welcome to The Read. Uh, tonight, I am very excited to have uh, a guest with me. Um, and uh, well, I see that she just dropped off, so let me let me see if I can get her back real quick before I before I get started. Okay, looks like look like she's back. Uh, so let me do a quick intro for you. Uh, tonight's guest has a roller coaster of a story. In her book titled I Rise, she details all of the highs and lows of her life, from growing up as a, quote, sissy boy in a strict Christian household to becoming a highly successful owner of a fitness calendar and eventually making the decision to transition, leaving her homeless and forced into sex work to survive. So how does she rise above? What is she doing now? And what is her message for other transgender people experiencing similar struggles? Find out now as we witness the transformation of Tony Newman. Go on. Hi, Jared. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. It's awesome. It's, it's great having you. Um, I loved reading your story, and I'm excited to be able to share this with everybody watching. Um, so let me just jump into the questions here. Let's get started. Uh, so when you were young, your family was very religious, and uh, many thought you were gay, but you dared not speak about your feelings of being born in the wrong body. Uh, so how did it feel to not be able to even speak about speak about this to your family uh, growing up? Uh, first and foremost, I want to say, Jared, I come from a wonderful mother and father. My mother's still living. My father's past. I was raised in a Christian a home filled with the Holy Ghost. And they did the best that they can the knowledge that they had. At that time, there was no transgenders on TV with transgenders. There were no examples to follow. So I basically came out as gay knowing that was only half of the story because they knew gay people, but no one, not even I, knew a transgender person in the 90s when I wanted to come out. I didn't know not one person who was transgender. I saw not one person who was transgender uh, at that time. So uh, I came out as gay and it felt, I felt in, in a box, but it was the way it had to be because I had no examples to follow. I had no books to read. I had no one to call. There was no helpline, transgender, defense, law center. There was none of that. So uh, I was playing it by ear. I is gay. I knew I was something else, but that's my first step was coming out as gay. Okay. Okay. So you didn't even really have a label at that time to put on it, based on what I had read in your book. Um, and, I had no clue. Right. I didn't know what you call it because it was in the nineties. <laughs> you know, I saw a drag queen by the Marine Base every blue moon, but that was a, obviously a man in a wig, and it, it just, I had no example. No, okay. Nothing to yeah, say. So. This is the path to follow. <laughs> yeah. So like. So now. You called it transvestite we, in the nineties, and now it's called transgender. But we were called transvestite in the nineties. Is what they called them. You a transvestite, which is really a drag queen, one who's on hormones. But that's what we said. That's all we knew. Right. You know, that was one of the other questions that I had as well because of your use of the word transsexual in the book, um, and a lot of people say transgender now. So I was wondering, is there really, is there a difference in those terms? Um, are they interchangeable or is one more accepted than the other? The correct terminology is transgender, but in the 90s, we were called transvestite and transsexual. Okay, all right. That's um, the terminology I used. Even though I was said I was politically incorrect, but that's what we use. So I wanted to keep it 100 um, because this is new to me, transgender. Back in my day, we were transvestite and transsexual. Okay. All right. Understandable. Um, so now I remember you mentioning something about like seeing like drag queens and stuff. Um, so I know like in college, that's... In, in your book, that that I believe was your first um, yes. first time seeing them. I went to Wake Forest. I met Maya Angelou, but when it got nighttime, the freaks come out. 
<laughs> and I went to the local gay bar with all these beautiful black six feet two drag queens signs were. And I don't know what they did in the day, but they would do the drag shows at night and then hit the streets. And I would see them in the club and I'd say, where are you guys going? They said, we got to go make our coins. <laughs> and that terminology, but 10 years later, that would become a very familiar quote for me. I got to go make my money because I end up doing what they did. I was them. Yeah. I was doing what they were doing. The same way, the same place, just in New York, not North Carolina. So what was that early learning process like for you when you first met the drag queens and kind of was able to kind of put, put a name onto what you were feeling? Well, I was a student at Wake Forest. I was on scholarship. My parents were taking care of me. I felt secure. But when it was all over at three in the morning, when they go to the street, I go back to my dormitory. I would go back to the campus of Wake Forest. So I was in field, but I wasn't identifying with them at that moment. It was like an out of body experience. I'm connected for a few hours, and then I went back to my world. Mm. I'm student at Wake Forest. I'm studying. Nobody knew where I went at night. I came back at 4 or 5 in the morning. I took off my makeup and my wig and put it in the trunk. It was exciting. It wasn't real. As a, Oh, this is fun. It was a fun thing to do back in 81 to 85 as a student at Wake Forest until I graduated. It wasn't until 95 calling. It called me to be who they were, to do what they did, I got the calling to say, this is it. This is your time. You got to be real. And then it happened. But 85 was more like, oh, I'm just having a good time. I'm not really one of you guys. I'm just hanging out, honey. I go to a forest. I'm going to go back to school. Y'all have fun on the street tonight. Just take care. <laughs> I got you. That was I my mentality you. then. You know, I was like above considering myself above them, but 10 years later, I became them doing what they did. So it's ironic that I acted that way 10 years before, and then I became a street prostitute, a hustler. This would make funny comments about them. I became myself. That 10 years later, I became one of those girls. And I had yeah. a degree from Wake Forest, yeah. and it you did know, me uh, no good. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's there's a lesson in that, I guess. Um, yes, you, know, <laughs> because, you know, you know, you never know what's gonna happen. I guess you never know. I looked yeah. down on them, and then I became them. It's it's the story. That's how that's mm -hmm. how it works. Well, um, let's before we go into how how you got to that point. Um, mm -hmm. I do know, like after graduating, you had a couple of jobs. You ended up doing, um, you know, this fitness model calendar that ended up being pretty successful. Um, and yeah. at this point in the book, you mentioned you were trying to overwhelm your feminine side uh, with masculinity, but it ended up not working. So how did you feel when you reached the end of the road in that journey and learned that in order to be happy, you would have to begin your transition process? It was a lot to swallow, Jared. I had a really great body. And I'd been in Muscle Mags. I'd been on Ricky Lake. Sally Jesse Raphael was a big talk show at that time. So I had done some shows and really good looking boys. I mean, these, we, these boys had bodies. It's, you know, what we used to call bodies. And I got to that point and I realized that queen on the inside with all that muscle, nothing had really changed. I had changed my exterior to be a really muscular fit fitness model, but I was still on the inside. Mm. And no matter how far I went, how big my biceps got, and my waist got tight, I was still a woman on the inside. So the story to that is you can run and you can run, but eventually you have to live your truth. You have to live it. 
You and and I, I wasted maybe five or six years with this when I should have started earlier, mm -hmm. trying to be something I was not. And those people left me when I became transgender. All of those people who I thought were my closest allies, and I had no friends, no confidant, no allies. So it was really a waste of six years of my life being something that I, that's the point to that. I wasted time of my life doing something that was not my calling. Wow. Um, yeah, that must have been really, that must have been really tough. And, you know, just thinking about what happened after you actually made that decision to transition. Um, you know, I'm just wondering, like, what went, what went through your head when you first found out that living your truth and living as a transgender person would mean homelessness and sex work? Well, you know, Jared, I had my wig. And I was ready, and I went to all these job interviews, and these people were like, what? Uh, Tony Newman, uh, we're looking for Tony from Wake Forest. I'm like, I'm Tony from Wake Forest. They were like, oh, no, honey. Get out. <laughs> I interviewed for about 150 jobs, and I lived off of my savings for about four months, and then I found myself on the street, being those North Wake Forest girls in the club, all dolled up, no money in my pocket, having to go out and do tricks is what we called it. I got to go do a trick and make my coins is what we used to say. Uh, I cried a lot, Jerry. I cried a lot. You know, my family had rejected me. My bodybuilding friends had rejected me. My coworkers on my job. I borrowed $20 from everybody I could get $20 from. And I found myself in a very bad situation hardworking, and on the street with basically girls with no GED, all kinds of shit. And I'm like, how did this happen to me? And I met a friend called Capri, and she kind of woke me up one night and said, girl, you got to pay for that nasty room in Harlem living in that crack hotel. It's filthy, but it's a roof. Get on out here and get on and get to work. That I had to do it in order to survive. And I did that for about two years on the street of man of New York City in the winter, in the spring, in the fall, turning tricks and doing what I had to do to survive. I mean how to be a survivor. Smart kids, but I didn't know shit about the streets. The streets. Nothing about hustling. I learned quick. I, I got a real a life learning in how to hustle and make money. I learned a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, now that that kind of leads into my next question. Um, you know, well, here let, let me give you a couple quotes from your book, and just so our readers have some back. I mean, our watchers have some uh, background here. So you write. Somehow, I felt like I truly found my inner self, but I was also really at my lowest point. And uh, further on, you write, the harsh, cold reality was that I was good for all types of sexual fantasies, but no more than that. That was the hard truth of the Black transsexual life I had so longed for. So my question to you now is, like, how did you maintain your self-esteem at the lowest point in your life? I was hanging out with, were on drugs. They were alcoholic. And I just think by the grace of God, my self-esteem was on bare, thin, minimal. But I never got so low that I wanted to do crack or shoot up all the time to feel good about myself. And most of my friends on the street during that time, they drank a lot just to make themselves feel better about who they were. God, Jerry, that I didn't become a crack addict, get caught up and get HIV and AIDS as so many of my sisters have died from back then, become an addict and they're still battling some of them now for 20 years, on and off, in and out of rehab. It's just the grace of God. Yeah. And I think the spiritual upbringing I had, I, 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 I didn't feel Christian, but I still felt some type of love for God. Amen. For, for 18 years, I went to church three times a week. 
I, I prayed a lot, so I just tried to figure out, even though Christians had told me I was of no value, I just tried to figure out where I was. It was a tough time battling low self-esteem, not getting into drugs, not becoming an alcoholic and an addict. It was tough. And I don't, I'm not really sure how I managed that, but I did for two years. and came out, okay, unscathed, no cuts, no stabbings, no beating, no addictions. It's just the grace of God. Yeah, you know, you have, you seem to have a really strong sense of survival. Um, and that's something that I admired when, you know, kind of reading your story. Um, and you seem to have a knack of turning something into, uh, turning something that you need to do in order to survive into a success or to, into a successful venture. You had the fitness calendar um, and you built this, you know, dominatrix uh, mistress business. Um, then on to writing a book and then having part of that turned into a screenplay. So just to, just to, I guess, pivot just for a second here, what can you teach us about um, turning, turning these things into, what can you teach us about success? And what can you teach people about, you know, turning little things that you do just to get by into something profitable or, you know, something? I, I, I just spoke on this in San Francisco at the public library. Hard work, Jared. I figured out what it takes to get to point B, and I just do it. I'm not much of a, I'm going to do this type of person. I just do it. And for me, it's just point A to point B. It's, it's about survival and hard work. But it was a white mistress woman in law school who taught me the mistress business. She took me under her wing and helped me to come off the street and become a professional escort mistress, you know, on Park Avenue, dealing with only white men. So I got lucky. She came up one night. I like your style. You're very quiet. You always work alone. You know, I went to Duke University. I said, oh, my God, I went to Wake Forest. She's like, okay, honey, whatever. We don't have to make up stuff <laughs> from the beginning. But it worked out okay, and she taught me how to become an escort and a mistress. And then I began to employ people with that concept she gave me. Do it, girl. Canada. We're gonna go to Miami, Fort Lauderdale. We're gonna we're gonna sit in nice hotels and wait for these men to come right to our door. And it worked like a charm. It worked like a charm. And I taught maybe thirty other people. I employed maybe nineteen people throughout my career. And 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 some of them that went on to the, do good things. Some of them are acting. And then some are at it. So, you know, I, I gave the tools I was taught to them. But I'm just a hard worker, Jerry. I'm no smarter than anyone else, but I dedicate myself to my project. If I'm on the street, I'm going to be the, the smartest prostitute. I'm yeah. going to charge the maximum amount of dollars. I'm going to do the least amount of shit. I'm going to wear condoms. I'm going to take care of me and make my money. And that's what I did. I came out, you know, thank God, no AIDS, no, HIV, no diseases. And 90% of the girls now, they have HIV. So it was just a concept of hard work. It's what made me survive. That's it. Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that I uh, had noticed when you know when you were doing when you were doing the uh, the mistress uh, business, um, I noticed you had a lot of uh, straight uh, employees or, or a lot of straight yeah. people that you were working with. And one of the things that kind of crossed my mind was like, man, how difficult was it to see these people um, who you worked beside? able to move on and move into what we would say is quote unquote a normal lifestyle um and you were kind of i don't know if you i don't know if you felt stuck or if or you were just yeah kind of, yeah what was that what was that like for you to kind of see people move on and you were kind of in that space listen 
the female makes triple what the trans woman will make. She did clients that she would bring me in that would never would possibly call me. So I got paid for hooking her date up. Then I got paid for doing a date with her. So I, I got two payments at one time. She was doing four to five dates a day to my one to two dates a day. So I figured out females can do triple can do. So a male in the mix He's doing about the same as the trans female. And I had money coming from him, her, the trans, the trans, and money was just coming in. Well, I was living in this beautiful apartment, Sadie, eating at some of the best restaurants in West Hollywood, and nobody knew I was exact a mistress. A mistress, I didn't dress like a mistress when we went out, and most of my friends at that time were women right in. And they were really my money makers. They made four times the amount of money than any trans woman I could hire. So I, I tend to employ more women than trans because a lot of the trans women wouldn't show up. Unreliable. And the females were always about that money. <laughs> and they, they made better employees. Yeah. So there we go. Cool. Um, so I let me ask you. Now. I love my trans sisters, but they just were not good sex workers, baby. They, they just were not good at it. Who you know. charging hundreds of dollars. So this was not a $50 type of thing. We were dressing up in cop outfits and different things and doing fantasy work. At $300, you're really putting on a show. And you have to focus on doing the show. Oh, uh, uh, and uh, the females turn out to be better workers than the trans women. And I worked with a female for almost eight years, woman that I ever worked with. They went away, and she and I took together and brought other women in. She recruited other girls for me. She was a spokesman, would go in the strip clubs and bring them to me, and we would make money. So it worked out better with women for me than it did with trans women. All right. So, uh, so let me add, so now, Lau, this was a very, I don't want to say exciting, but it was very tumultuous time in your life. Uh, so chapter seven of your book was titled The Erotic Professionals. Um, and it was about your mm -hmm. time in business as a mistress with a master and another mistress. And this with chapter her specifically and another guy. Earned... We, we went away and then the three of us yeah, the three of us took it on the road and traveled to maybe 40 cities throughout America and throughout the world. That right. became my core. My core. It was a trans woman, a female, and a man. So when they were called, I said, what do you want, baby? I got muscles. I got a chick with boom. I've got a chick. You want him, her, you want him, her. How do you want it? And people are like, oh my God, I, I'll take the triple special. <laughs> I'm like, Bring me that card and we charge it up and we all get paid. And I would do dates that sometimes he would bring in that was just curious. She would bring in dates that would really never call me. They had no interest per se in me, but were fascinated by a trans woman, a woman and a man all at once a little show we did. And we did a lot of threesome. A lot. I tried it and maybe five minutes I stayed in the room and made 300 bucks. And, he, and they would say, okay, that's enough. That was great. They really wanted. He did nothing but stand there. Um, so so it, it was an interesting time. We made, a, we made very good money. I hardly did anything to make that money. Huh. People are like, oh, you're working so hard being a sex person. I'm like, honey, I, I didn't, I didn't even take my clothes off. I, I, I had no sex today, and I did three days. So I would be careful about that. I said I had the most protected sex ever because I didn't touch anybody. It was just fascinating. Yeah. They would just pay for me to come in the room. The weirdest stuff, weirdest thing. So, so was it, was it all of those, all of those? Odd moments is that what made it 
good for for a movie or for a because it eventually was turned into a short film. Uh, what, yeah, what was it called? That's um, the most exciting part. I, that, I mean, you know, when you talk about transition, nobody really wants to hear about that. Taking hormones, that's not fun. So we took the most interesting part of the three of us doing the nasty, traveling the, 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 the country. It's the most exciting part of the book. Um, and my partner, Alton, and the British director, Keith, said, we want it nasty and hot. And that's the nastiest and hottest and erotic, sexual part of the book. And, and we thought that was more commercial. And that's why we said erotic professionals changed the title to Heart of a Woman. Because the erotic professionals had one person in there who believed she had a heart of a woman, but she was born a man. Play on words. A heart of a woman, she was really born with a penis. So it's kind of a play on words type of thing. Yeah. yeah. A woman, and you were born with a penis. Even though you may have had something, a surgery, you were born with a penis, so it was a play on words. Yeah, I got that. Um, so you're, in your bio on your website, it states it would be her greatest wish to be the first African-American transgender to have her script made successfully into a feature film. So would you consider your dream accomplished with the creation of this film? No, because we haven't entered the theaters yet. We did a short film. We're looking for $3 million. We spent about 29000 on this, but we want $3 million so we can go into a theater and have Jared go into a theater and see it on the big screen, a $3 million production, and we hope to make $10 million. That is really where we would like to see this. American Transform, do a million dollar movie, and then have it shown at limited, maybe 50 theaters throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Where people could go and buy a ticket, they're Miami, New York, Boston, Chicago, Detroit, and say, hey, I want to go see uh, the movie, Part of a Woman. It would, that would be, that's where we're headed. And we're trying to get $3 million to do that now. To do it for okay. 30 days of shooting for an hour and a half. That's the goal. We just did a short movie now and we're just submitting it to film festivals. So, no. That goal has not been achieved yet. No, sir. No, sir. Okay. All right. Well, look, I'm holding out for you because it is a very interesting story. And I think, um, I think a lot of people would uh, would be enter would definitely be entertained, and um, I think it would definitely shed a lot of light on you, like you know the movie that, that Matthew life. McConaughey and Jared Leto did. You remember that movie that Jared Leto played the drag queen? Uh, McConaughey was like was like his friend, and Jared Leto eventually got AIDS. Oh God, I can't think of the name of the movie. Hmm. But Jared Leto won the Oscar for it. He won the Oscar for uh, playing the drag queen. I'm oh forgetting. God, I can't think of it. Oh <laughs> God, it's in my book. it's in the marketing package. But yeah, we would like to see that done in a black version with not only a trans woman, but a hot female and guy. Just just an actor, a female trying to be a singer, and we're all surviving together to eventually get to that next step. So that's where we're trying to go with you. Sounds good. Sounds good. So during this time, um you mentioned, I mean, there was one part where you went back to Vegas and you were arrested. Got arrested. Oh, and he, and he had saw me the night before. I was like, what? <laughs> he comes to the room. He pays for me and her. We say, okay, we're leaving tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. It was nice to see you. Nice to meet you. We leave. We, we're in Hooters in Vegas. We go downstairs and have the Hooter wings. We're getting ready to go the next day. We did two dates. We're packing. He calls back. We've already seen him naked. We've done things with him. He says, I'd like to make an appointment. I say, oh, no, we're leaving. We leave in three hours. We've got to go to McCarran, which is Las Vegas Airport. She says, oh, he paid well. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. Yeah. So I say, no, he calls her. See you. He said, I'm going to do one more. I go downstairs and have a drink. Then she calls me and says, you remember the guy we saw the other night? He wants to see us both. I go back upstairs. 
and then nine people, two black women, they all come up and arrest us. And I said, oh my God, we've already seen this guy. What? what, what if I had a camera, if we were on Facebook, I'd have took a picture. Like, we saw him the other night. We did things to him that's un, unspeakable. He's arresting us, and we go to jail. Ugh. Isn't that crazy? I'm insane. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? crazy? He's an crazy. undercover cop. He goes through the whole scene, comes back uh, two nights later, and takes him to jail. And we're two hours from going from the airport. If she'd have said no to that date, we'd have never got arrested. Wow. Love of money, but we went to jail. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that was uh, I know that you had mentioned, yeah. you know, even when you were in New York, that some of the cops would kind of tell you ahead of time. Yeah, they see you in their plain clothes, and then they go back, and then they come back in the van, and you're like, didn't I just see you two months <laughs> ago? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, this is some crazy shit going on here. Half you people are seeing me and me, my sister. You're putting us in jail with men. You're talking about yeah, that's a man, but just the night before we were lovers. But it's the mentality of this. It's just even now, pop uh, and the R&B world that same mentality. They sleep with them at midnight, and the next day they're calling them all kind of names. Oh, I would never do that. I would never be with that type of person. It's just psychotic in my mind. Yeah. That you can be so intimate with someone the night before and then just you beat them up the next day with a group of guys. You're like beating them up. It's like, what are you doing? You were just with me two nights ago and you're throwing rocks at me with these guys. Are you psychotic? Crazy. Crazy. It still happens now, though. I mean, I read these stories with girls doing the same thing, messing with these R&B and hip-hop guys and rappers. I, I don't do that. They are doing it. Mm -hmm. And then in the daytime, they won't even admit that they are whatever you want to call it. It's just, it drives me crazy. Yeah. It yeah. still happens do now. It still happens do you, think, years. do you think that more acceptance of different sexuality, of, you know, of sexuality just in general, different sexualities? Yeah, um, I think, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think, think it's more accepting, but um, still yeah. there's a shame. There's still a shame in that black community to say, I was with a trans woman. A little shame there. I mean, they seem to be accepting in the R&B. There's gay rappers now, gay R&B singers. That seems to be cool, but still, no, they don't want to admit I'm attracted to a trans female. They, they, they seem to be cool, like, you know, I don't have anything against gay folk. They're good, they're okay, but they, they, they still want to admit we're attracted to trans women. And that's still happening today. Still happening. Still happening today. We still have a lot of work with getting black community trans and the men that love them. The men that want them, get and do it at night and sneak out and go home to their girlfriends. They're still doing it. They're still doing it. Yeah. And that, I, I think it's going to take a yeah. while. It's still happening. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, that's why, that's why your story is so important because I think the more that people um, can see that, you know, you're human beings just like everybody else uh, yeah. and can empathize that it, 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 slowly that will break down. I mean, I think we're already... See, I've never really it. wanted to be like Jared. I just want to be respected. Mm-hmm. You know, I work in corporate America now. There are some people don't like me. They think what I've done to my body, ah, I do my job, and they respect me, and I respect them. Everybody's not going to like everybody. Everybody's not going to love everybody. I respect yeah. you. You respect me. At the end of the day, I can't really ask everyone to like me, to not to gender me in the right form and all of that. That's great. So, the realism mm -hmm. is, I want you to respect me, and I respect you. What I've done to my body is my business. I'm not asking you to sleep with me and be my lover. I'm asking you, we're a coworker. The job done, and that's where I am now. And it's worked for the last eight years in corporate America. Jerry, they're just not. They're not yeah. going to agree with what I've done. 
So I can accept that you don't agree, but just respect me. Let's be respectful to one another. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day. That's, yeah, that's definitely that's definitely um, a, a big piece. And you know, before you got into corporate America, um, you started you started with uh, learning law. So. Gotcha. I mean, like I know that. That two years of law. Yeah. And that's what made me, because I used to get arrested, and they had violated my rights. They were my clients. I seen them sexually. They seen my girlfriend. And when I got a lawyer, he got me out all the time immediately. He's like, no, we, drop this. Drop it. This was my client. And he would say, well, we're going to go public with this. Drop the charges. And I realized Learning the law would protect me when I got myself in legal obstacles. Oh, and quote it back to the police officer. Go home. Just go. Just go home. That's it. Just by learning the law. And it protected me. Because I didn't know my rights. So a street prostitute and you think they can do anything to you, they can't. Even right. though they consider you trash a whore, I still had rights. Yeah. It saved no. me from my own headache. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think that that's something that's important for like all minorities in any, you know, in any sense of the word, you know, to, to kind of know what their rights are because, you know, you you can get, you can easily get taken advantage of. Um, so I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, go ahead, I'm sorry. My Angelo said, when you know better, so I learned the law so I could do better, you know, and I, I learned how to keep myself out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let me ask you about, uh, let me ask you more about the book itself. So how does it feel to be the first African-American transgender person to write a memoir in the United States? Now, I've been told by, I'm not the first. But I can't find the book that they're making reference to. We had researched <laughs> this through, uh, through books, and I'm not found it. So I'm technically saying I'm the first uh, trans woman to be in Ebony, to be in The Advocate, well over 50,000 copies. I don't know of any other book before mine that did that. I stick to that, but two trans women have called me and said there was something in 1987 book. Okay. So they said she was the first. But I can't find the book, Jared. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I, I'm, I'm still saying it. <laughs> it me. I haven't found facts to back it up. So I'm still saying I'm the first African-American trans woman to write a book public and to be read by a couple of people. <laughs> okay, awesome. Awesome. I mean, look, it's awesome. definitely an achievement anyway, regardless. Yeah, um, they'll probably call me when they, they're probably going to call me and say, I thought you, somebody else wrote a book in 1987 on that book, Jared. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, All right. The, book uh, that the black girl wrote in 87. And I don't know if she nominated for a Lambda Literary Award, but I have been. Award, so. I'm going to claim the title. There you go. <laughs> Call to say that's not true. We'll just let it go. We'll let it go. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> um, so if people don't get anything else, what is the one thing that you would want them to take away from your story? Your authentic truth. Don't wait. Don't perpetrate. Don't wait 10 years. Don't wait two years. If that is your calling, get to it and do it today. I wasted 10 to 12 years doing a lot of BS things. Authentic truth. New today, I've never been more happier. I've never been more loved, respected. It was well worth the journey. I just wish I could have started it 10 years earlier. I wasted a lot of time, Jerry, trying to be a phony and a fake. Live your authentic self today, right now. Gotcha. Start in the morning. 
starting in the morning. Got you. <laughs> I got you. All right. So Don't that's wait uh, another day. All right. Yeah, that's a uh, it's a very it's a very good message, and it's one that I um that I've definitely tried to follow Are myself. You and I hope a lot of people out there listening. Jerry? Are you living your authentic truth, Jerry? Uh. I am, you, I'm trying to, uh, I hope I am, um, you know, I, I, I constantly am reflecting, oh, okay. you know, so I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to improve and, and that's all you can do. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> that's all you can do. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so you're an activist and you've done a ton of service in the fight for LGBTQ equality. Um, how can the LGB section of the community be better serve its trans brothers and sisters? We got Trump saying that he's going to kick out 15,000 trans men and women in the military Ugh. to come up and join us. We uh, got the Transgender Law Center and the National Center for Lesbian Rights have filed a lawsuit. And uh, we need your support. We are the most financial, we, we, out of the LGBT, we have the less power because we have the less money. Are still evolving. Money equals power. When we were fighting for gay marriage and I was working at EQCA, we raised hundreds of millions of dollars for marriage. Type of support for transgender equality. Time, open your wallet and give and want it with about a billion dollars. Um, we need that type of we need that type of uh, power now. Yeah. Equate power in this fight of Iowa. Okay. Get it. Is there is there a place specifically um, where people can give. I mean, is there, maybe I could put a link up at the bottom of the uh, screen here after we're done. I, I, I'm a big supporter of the transgenderlawcenter.com org. Oakland, I'm on the development committee. So Yashi, they're fighting across the country. Lawyers to go and fight for people who need help, equality. So they, they, I'm a big supporter of there. Okay. Okay, cool. So I'm going to make sure I have that link down there. Oakland, um, okay. They do great work. They do great work. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so let me ask you, what's next for you? And are there any more books or screenplays in the future? No, well, my partner, Alton, who's an actor, wants to write another book co-authored with him, but this would be his book, Meditation and Yoga. Uh, it's about encouraging other people to live your authentic life. Uh, we're trying to get $3 million, Jared, to do a feature film to get it to the theater. <laughs> Lee Daniels, anybody get to it and get 10% so I can pay you. Yeah, look, anybody I'll out there you listening. If you can... <laughs> The money to get to the theater. Yeah, we got to yeah, get you know, the story we out there. Yeah, we want to have a limited release across the country, at least the 20 major cities, New York, Detroit, Boston. It would be awesome. Yeah. All right. So it awesome. that was, uh, was great. Um, so where can people find out more about you and your work? Uh, I'm at TonyDNewman.com with an I. We have a short trailer uh, that we just produced and we're submitting it to Sundance the week. So we'll be submitting it to film festivals next year. And uh, it's completely done and edited. And uh, somebody will see it and say, oh my God, I want to get give you three million dollars and, and uh tonydnewman.com film.com 
Fantastic. All right. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me tonight. That's all the questions that I have for you. And, um, you know, I just, I want to tell everybody out there that they need to pick up I Rise, The Transformation of Tony Newman. It uh, is eye-opening. It's, uh, it's emotional. Um, definitely go pick up that book and get the, get the full story. And um, thank you, Tony, for joining me. I really appreciate it. All right. So everyone go to bed now. I know it's about 12, one o'clock in your area. <laughs> yes, it is late. It is oh, late. Martin, so, it's yeah. still early in California. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm going to turn this off and I'm going to get to bed. So. But <laughs> have uh, a good night. So Jerry. Uh, yes, you have a good night as well. Goodbye, everybody.